The Exorcist was a critically acclaimed novel written by author William Peter Blatty and published by Harper and Rowe in 1971. And since receiving a film adaptation by director William Friedkin and Warner Brothers, it has earned the reputation for being the scariest film ever made. Perhaps that enduring title is due to its ability to shock the senses of its viewers by penetrating the psyche, as opposed to relying strictly on traditional stock horror cues, like jump scares or overly highlighting oblong creatures that walk funny. There are aspects of it that are visceral and remain effective to this day. Those that fall within the lines of cinema fans like found footage and the now popular elevated horror genres lack a certain depth. Well, found footage films like Paranormal Activity relied more on visual gags to disturb the viewer. The films being dubbed elevated horror, like 2019's Us and 2018's Hereditary, offer certain yarns that may be considered a cut above in quality, but are too transparently self-aware of what it is they are setting out to accomplish. The Exorcist never really faced this problem, possibly because horror as a film genre at that time lacked any kind of mainline respectability. It was viewed as a breeding ground for young actors and a tool for them to cut their teeth, but not much else. The Exorcist upon its release caught the ire of Catholic advocacy groups and sprung the disdain of those in a moral panic. It would later go on to be nominated for 10 Academy Awards and win two, one for Best Adapted Screenplay and the other for Sound Mixing. Since it made a splash in 1973, Warner Brothers and the property's current owner, Morgan Creek, had sought to milk The Exorcist's name by turning that should-have-been-solo film into a franchise. What followed was a disappointing sequel with a star-studded cast in 1977. Exorcist II The Heretic saw the return of Linda Blair and Max von Sydow of the original Exorcist film. But without William Friedkin's master touch guiding the project, or the novel and screenplay's author William Peter Blatty handling the script, the project was seemingly doomed from the start. John Borman was handed the reins as director, and what was released became a public embarrassment for Warner Brothers. In spite of being viewed as the preferential pick to the original by the likes of critic Pauline Kael and filmmaker Martin Scorsese, Exorcist II The Heretic was denounced as one of the worst films ever made. It would take 13 years for at least another Exorcist film to be greenlit by a major studio, and when it was, they at least had the sense to bring back some of the creative talent that made that first movie spark. William Peter Blatty would return to the franchise he created as the film's writer and director, basing the production on his 1983 novel Legion. However, not unlike Exorcist II The Heretic, this one would suffer a number of production hiccups, including drastic reshoots. These troubles would follow with the 2004 prequel, Exorcist The Beginning, originally titled Dominion, and helmed by first reformed director Paul Schrader. The near-finished film Schrader handed in was mauled by Warner Brothers executives and forced into reshoots under the guidance of cliffhanger director Rennie Harlan. And since then, there have been no new Exorcist films. However, Fox Television did greenlight an Exorcist television series that ran for two seasons and served as an alternative timeline sequel to that William Friedkin classic. Taking a cue from the likes of horror franchises such as the Texas Chainsaw Massacre and Halloween, the Exorcist series blots out the events of Exorcist 2, 3, and the prequels and offers a continuation in the life of Reagan McNeil, this time played by Gina Davis instead of Linda Blair. According to Rotten Tomatoes, this series was well received by critics, but also according to Rotten Tomatoes, every series is well received by critics. You'd be hard pressed to find a television series ever dipping into the negative, and I do mean hard pressed. To be fair, the field of entertainment criticism has left a lot to be desired, at least as of this decade. For more than a century we've looked to our quality filters, the entertainment and journalistic industries, to determine what is to be considered legitimate and what is not. What is official and what isn't. If we are to follow the rubric set by Eon Productions when it comes to the 007 franchise, that leaves Sean Connery's final Bond outing in Never Say Never Again as illegitimate in spite of its authenticity to the film character and the franchise itself. 
It's often looked at as the black sheep of the series by Bond fans and is excluded from licensed box sets. To add to that, although it received a warm reception when it was initially released in 1983, because of that outsider status, outlooks on the film have drifted more to focusing on the negatives than the positives, almost as if to retroactively reinforce the business perspective on its standing. More recently, when talks of an alternative true-to-form cut of Zack Snyder turned Joss Whedon's Justice League are prompted, film journalists are quick to poo-poo the prospect that releasing such a cut wouldn't be worth Warner Brothers' time. Naturally, the studio with the capability to release such a cut remains silent. But these things are not unprecedented. One could look at the Warner Brothers release of the 2006 Richard Donner cut of Superman 2 as a primary example which, to bring things back around, makes all of this curious considering this is the same studio that released two versions of Exorcist the Beginning within a couple of years of each other. Why does there seem to be a reluctance to the prospect of reconsidering what one has been told is authentic or inauthentic when it comes to something as superficial and frequently changing as pop culture? In 2014, Warner Brothers released a six-film box set titled Exorcist, The Complete Collection, which offered two variations of that inaugural film, the theatrical cut and an extended edition that was falsely labeled the director's cut that was released in theaters in the year 2000. These were in addition to the disappointing pipeline of sequels that followed. One could challenge the notion that this is a complete collection or even a true collection at all as these films, with the exception of one, are not only tonally inconsistent with one another, but share little in common as far as quality, depth, or simply creative DNA. They all chase after the horror that Friedkin's Exorcist brought without fundamentally understanding what it was that made that film scary. Aside from director William Friedkin, the only other person who could possibly understand that is William Peter Blatty. There is a true Exorcist trilogy, one that shares a consistent bloodline and has little concern for its scares so much as it is analyzing psychology. And this trilogy currently exists unchallenged in another medium, that of literature. In 1980, William Peter Blatty wrote, directed, and produced an adaptation of his 1966 novel Twinkle Twinkle Killer Kane. It was titled The Ninth Configuration. The Ninth Configuration and The Exorcist, published in 1971, exist in the same universe as one another and feature a character by the name of Captain Billy Cutshaw. Cutshaw is an astronaut and an acquaintance of Chris McNeil, the mother of the possessed girl Reagan in both the novel of The Exorcist and in the 1973 film. The character is portrayed by actor Dick Callanan in Friedkin's rendition. While attending a party as a guest at the McNeil residence, Cutshaw is confronted by the young, demon-possessed Reagan McNeil, who cryptically tells him, unprompted, you're going to die up there, insinuating that his next trip will end in death. The events of The Exorcist take place before those of Twinkle Twinkle Killer Kane. In the novel and in its film adaptation, The Ninth Configuration, Cutshaw is a prominent character. We learn that before being able to head out into space, Cutshaw suffered a critical nervous breakdown. It forced him out of his responsibilities and into a psych ward before the mission could be initiated. The connective tissue, both in terms of story and the creative team behind the Ninth Configuration, is just as legitimate, if not more so, than John Borman's bastardized sequel, Exorcist II The Heretic which, again, only sought to recapture the same scares as its predecessor and not offer anything fresh or of value. The Ninth Configuration would deal with similar theological themes to that of The Exorcist, albeit in a new setting that would help build a bridge between The Exorcist and William Peter Blatty's 1990 film Exorcist III, otherwise known as Legion. Legion similarly takes place in a psych ward and explores another character from that original film, Lieutenant William F. Kinderman, who is investigating what seems to be copycat serial killings of the long-deceased Gemini killer. As mentioned before, this movie, released in cinemas as The Exorcist 3, faced studio interference that completely warped what the film was intended to be. In novels especially, it is not uncommon for a sequel to be only loosely attached 
to its previous installment. It's natural that Blatty, starting as a novelist, would approach the medium of film in a similar fashion. In Legion's original form, character actor Brad Dourif, best known for lending his voice as the manic killer doll Chucky in the Child's Play series, plays both Father Damien Karras taking over the part from Jason Miller in that 1973 film, and the Gemini Killer, who has been inhabiting his body for roughly 15 years. The first cut of Legion was an eerie psychological thriller that didn't go over the top with the more supernatural elements that are found in the theatrical cut of the film, the final version, that was affected by studio meddling. It was a dark, worthy follow-up of The Exorcist and felt much more in line with the ninth configuration than Exorcist II The Heretic, but there wasn't money to be made off of the name Legion, and thus once more executives from Warner Brothers decided to step in and make some changes, because Legion was not considered Exorcist enough for audiences. So when the schedule of actor Jason Miller, who in fairness William Peter Blatty had shown interest in recasting his Karis, opened, the studio forced the director to reshoot more than half of his film and retool it to be specifically transparent as an Exorcist sequel. Jason Miller would occupy half of Dorif's role rather than absorbing it entirely as the studio had initially insisted, and music from that first film was to be shoehorned into the beginning of the movie. But perhaps the biggest change, from Legion to Exorcist 3, was the inclusion of an exorcism in the grand finale. Peter Blatty was forced to include a brand new character while reshooting his film, an exorcist by the name of Father Morning, as played by Nicole Williamson. And this completely redundant character would be thrust to the head of the film, where Lieutenant Kinderman and the Gemini Killer would square off in a battle of faith, hasting the wills of good and evil. And while an argument can be made that the theatrical cut of Exorcist 3 is a superior cinematic vehicle, that work print copy of Legion was truer to William Peter Blatty's original vision. In 2016, a distributor of niche films and horror classics, Shout Factory, would release a rough composite of Legion as a supplemental bonus disc for their remaster of The Exorcist 3. Unfortunately, due to time, much of that original footage had been lost and was substituted with VHS dailies from the set in order to bridge the gaps. As it stands, a cut of the film is now widely available, and William Peter Blatty lived to see his vision restored to a much truer degree. These three films, while wildly different from one another, formed a perfect trilogy of movies that belonged to their creator. And that can't be said for many other horror franchises. So while there may be a plethora of inferior films with that exorcist branding, among that collective, there is a true trilogy to be found.